Chapter 21 of The Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Are you going out, Gerrit? asked Dadeline. She was surprised to see him come down the stairs, dressed in uniform. He had spent the morning in bed, but he felt better now, and a feverish excitement acted like a spur. He said in answer to his wife's question that he was better, played for a moment with Hurdy, took his lunch standing, and then hurried out of the house and rushed through a parade at barracks where he was not expected. The fever, which he still felt sending shivers through his great body, drove him out of barracks again, and he walked to the Kirchhoff Lan and asked Troucher if there was any news of her master or mistress. If Master Addy had had a telegram from Paris, but Troucher didn't know. Then he tore off like one possessed, first to Otto and Francis's house, where he found Francis and Louise, both sick with waiting. Otto had gone to Barn to break the news to Bertha. He could not stay with the two women, Francis wandering from room to room, crying helplessly, Louise, calmer, looking after the children the entire care of whom she had taken on herself since she had come to live with Otto, and since Francis had become such an invalid. Gerrit could not possibly stay. With long strides he flew to the Alexanderstraat, to Mamma, who was glad to see him well again, after his two days' illness. He found Doreen with her, Adolphine called, followed by Cato, all obeying an impulse not to leave the old woman alone in these days when, at any moment, van der Velke, Constance and Emily might arrive from Paris, bringing home the body of Henri, of whose death no one had telegraphed any details, much to the indignation of Adolphine and Cato. But when Auntie Lot came in, her small eyes red and swollen with weeping, and cried, Oh dear, Cassian, an exclamation at once hushed by the children, an exclamation which Mamma, staring dimly into space, failed to understand. Gerrit could no longer endure it among all those overwrought women, and, convinced that Mamma did not even yet know that Constance and van der Velke had gone to Paris, convinced that the sisters had not even paved the way by telling her that Henri was seriously ill, he cleared out suddenly without saying goodbye, and rushed into the open air, down the street, into the woods, gasping for breath. What was it? What could it be, hanging in the air? The clouds seemed to be bending over the town in pity, an immense yearning pity, which turned into a desperate melancholy, while Gerrit hurried along with his great strides. The wintry trees lifted their crowns of branches in melancholy despair, the rooks called and circled in swarms, the bells of the tramcars tinkled as though muffled in black crepe. The few pedestrians walked stiffly and unnaturally. He met ague-stricken, black-clad figures with sinister spectral faces. They passed him like so many ghosts, and all around him, in the vistas of the woods, rose a clammy mist, in which every outline of houses, trees and people was blurred into a shadowy unreality and it seemed to Gerrit as if he alone were real and possessed a body, and he ran and rushed through the spectral landscape, through the hollow avenues of death. What was it in the air? Nothing, nothing extraordinary. It was winter in Holland, and the people, the people had nothing extraordinary about them. They walked in thick coats and cloaks, with their hands in their pockets, because it was cold and, because the mist was cold and raw, their eyes looked fixed, their lips and noses drawn and pinched, and they bore themselves rigidly and spectrally when they came towards him out of the fog and passed him with those shadowy and unreal figures. And, with all sorts of fever-born images whirling before his eyes, like shining will-o'-the-wisps in that morning mist, his thoughts touched hastily on every sort of subject. He saw the barracks before him, Pauline, 
the Paris train and Constance and van der Velke in a compartment with Henry's coffin between them, Auntie Lot and Mamma, Bertha at Barn. He saw his boyhood at Boutensorg, the foaming river, all his bright-haired children. He saw a worm, big as a dragon, with bristles like lances, sticking straight out of its dragon's back. He was still feverish, and had been unwise to get up and go out. But he could not have stayed in bed, he could not have done it. His feverish excitement had driven him to the barracks, to his mother, and to... Where was he going? Was he going to Scheveningen? And why was he going through the woods like that? What was it that constantly impelled him to keep to the right, to turn up the paths on the right? as though he were making for the newer vague. What did he want on the right? Suddenly, as a counter-agent to his fever, he turned to the left, but on coming to a crossroad, he wandered off to the right again, helplessly, as if he had forgotten the way. There was the ornamental water, with the newer vague behind it. There lay the ponds, like two dull weather-worn mirrors, under the sullen pity of the skies and the rather tame landscape of the woods, with its wreath of dunes, became cruel, a tragic pool surrounded by all that avenue of chill death, which seemed to be creeping through the wintry air. But what was it in the air? Why, there was nothing, nothing but the ornamental water, in a misty haze, the few villas around it, looming vaguely out of the fog, no pedestrians at all, Nothing but the familiar, everyday, usual things. Then what impelled him to wander so aimlessly past the ornamental water to the newer vague? Why were those ponds like tragic pools? Was it not as though pale faces stared out of them, out of those tragic pools, pale white faces of women, multiplied a hundredfold by strange reflections? Eddies of white faces, with dank, plastered hair, and dying eyes which gleamed. Yes, yes, he was in a fever. He had been unwise to go out in that chill morning mist. But it was rotten to be ill, and he was never ill. He had never said that he was ill. He was a fellow who could stand some knocking about, but for all that he was feverish. Otherwise he would not have seen the ornamental water as a tragic pool, with the white faces of mermaids. Lord, how cold and shivery the mermaids must feel down there, in those chilly, silent pools, their dying eyes just gleaming up with a single spark. Were they dead or alive, the chilly mermaids? Were their eyes dying, or were they ogling? How strangely they were all reflected, until they became as a thousand mermaids, until their faces blossomed like white flowers of death above the light film of ice coating the pool. Phew! How chill and cold they were, the poor dead, ogling mermaids! Dead? Were they dead? Were they ogling and laughing, with eyes of gold? He shivered as though ice-cold water were trickling down his spine, and he wrapped himself closely in his military greatcoat. He felt something hard in his breast pocket, a square piece of cardboard. Yes, he had been carrying that about for ever so long, and yet, and yet, he couldn't do it. It was the photograph of his children, the latest group taken for Mamma's last birthday. For weeks he had been carrying it about in his pocket, in an envelope with an address on it, and yet, yet he couldn't send it or hand it in at her door, the portrait of all his children. I expect they're charming, kiddies, Gerrit. Gad, how could she have asked it? How could she have asked it as though to drive him mad? Phew, how cold it was! He looked fearsomely at the mermaids. No, no, there was nothing, nothing but the chilly pool. He was in a high fever, that's what it was. God, how could she ask such a thing? Still, 
Still, it was over. She was no longer the girl she was. She was finished with, done for. She had lain in his arms like a corpse, tired of her own kisses, broken by his embrace, white as a sheet, done for. Lord, how rotten to be done for, and still so young. A young woman, done for, like a defective machine. Lord, how rotten. No, he couldn't give that photograph, of all his children, to a lighter love. He couldn't do it. If she had only asked for a necklace or some such gourd, he would have managed somehow, out of his poverty, to buy her a nice keepsake. <sighs> How raw and cold it was! The will-o'-the-wisps of all sorts of images shone in front of him, and through them, through the flames, the flying Paris Express, with the compartment, the coffin, van der Velke, Constance, two motionless figures. And yet it was bitterly, clammily cold. He was chilled to his marrow, and a great hairy dragon split its beastly maw to lick that chilled marrow with a fiery tongue. How big the filthy brute had grown! It was no longer inside him. It was all around him now. It filled the air with its wriggling body. It lifted its tail among the wintry boughs, and its tongue of fire licked at Herit's marrow. And under that marrow, how strange! He was simply freezing. Brrr, brrr. Lord, how he was shivering! What a fever he was in! Home, home, to bed! Oh, how good to get into bed! Nice and warm, nice and warm! Still better to be nice and warm in women's arms! No kissing, just sleeping, nice and warm! Brrr, brrr. Lord, Lord, Lord! The water pouring down his back! Never in his life had he shivered like that. How hard that photograph of his children was. He felt it on his heart like a plank. How long had he been carrying it about with him? Brrr, brrr. He might just as well have let her have it. It was the only thing she had asked him for. Money. He had never given her. Only fifteen guilders. Brrr, brrr. Fifth. Brrr. Teen. Brrr. Guilders. Come, why not do it now? Just hand it in at her door. Brr, and then, brr, and then, brr, home to bed, nice and warm in bed. The thought suddenly took definite shape, and it drove him on along the canal. Here also the mist hung like a haze over the water and the meadows on the other side, and, Shivering and shuddering under the fiery lick of the dragon's tongue, Gerrit hurried to the Frederikstraat. That was where she lived. That was where he had been so often lately, until that last time when she had begged him not to come back again, and to give her, as a keepsake, the portrait, the portrait of his children. He would leave it now at the door. He had taken it in his hand, because it lay like a plank on his heart, and her name was on the envelope. Brr, hand it in quickly, and then, brr, nice and warm in bed. The landlady opened the door. Would you please give this to the young lady? He meant to shove the envelope into the woman's hand, and then, brr, brr, home, to bed, warm, warm. Don't you know, then, where the young lady is, sir? Where she is? Where she's gone to? Has she gone? She didn't come home yesterday afternoon. I don't say I'm anxious, but still, she always used to come home of an evening. She owes me some money, but she hasn't run away, for everything's been left as it was upstairs. Her clothes, her bits of jewellery. Perhaps she's out of town. Perhaps, only she's taken nothing with her. Perhaps, all the same. Yes, it's possible, so I'm to give her the envelope when she comes. Yes, or no, no, give it to me. I'll see to it myself. Or no, you'd better give it her when she comes back. No, after all, I'll see to it. 
He snuffed the envelope into his pocket, went off. Brr, it lay on his chest like a plank. Where could she be gone to? Where was Pauline gone to? Had she gone out of town? Why hadn't he simply left the envelope? Well, you never knew. If she didn't come back, it would be there, with the photograph of his children. She'd probably cleared out. Yes, she had probably cleared out, with her rich young fellow. Well, he, whoever he was, wouldn't remember her as he remembered her in the old days. <sighs> Lord, Lord, how he was shivering. Oh, to be in bed. When could Constance and van der Velke be back? Oh, the express. Oh, the coffin. Oh, the fiery lick of the dragon whose great hairy body filled the whole grey sky with its wriggling. He turned down the Java Strat. He wanted to hurry home. His teeth were chattering. He felt as if ice-cold water was dripping from him while the confounded brute sucked his marrow with long fiery licks of its tongue. Near the Schelpkader, he met a little group of four or five policemen. Rough words sounded loud. Their words sounded so loud through the unreality of the mist that they woke him out of a walking sleep, out of his dream of the dragon beast with the stiff bristles. She was quite blue, he heard one of them say. They were striding along, talking loudly, as if something startling had happened. Gerrit suddenly stood rooted to the ground. "'Who is blue?' he asked in a hoarse bellow. The policeman saluted. "'Sir, who is blue?' bellowed Gerrit. "'A woman, sir. A woman who drowned herself last night in the canal.' "'A woman?' "'Yes, sir. My mate here was the first to see the body when it was floating with a face out of the water. Then he came and told me and we went and fetched the drag. It was a young woman. And she was quite blue, you say? Yes, sir, and all bloated. She'd swallowed a lot of water. We took the body to the cemetery near the woods, and we're on our way to the commissary. To the cemetery? Yes, sir. The men saluted. Sir. She was quite blue, Gerrit repeated to himself, and he hurried on at a jog trot. Brr, brr. Oh, to be in bed. He wanted to get to bed. He was as cold as that woman must have been last night, floating in the water until her face blossomed up like a phantom flower of death. Brr, icy cold water. Wasn't he walking beside icy cold water twenty minutes ago? Hadn't it seemed to him that the whole tame landscape in its wreath of dunes had melted away into a hazy unreality with those ghostly villas and trees, and the ponds, like tragic pools, in which were mirrored the motionless low grey skies, full of the wriggling of his giant worm, until the faces of the mermaids, with wet plastered hair and gold gleaming eyes, had risen up like dead flowers, water lilies of death, and ogled him with the last quiver of their dying eyes. Oh, the Paris Express! Oh, what a fever he was in! He must go quick to bed now, but before he went he would just call in at the Kerkhoff Lahn and ask if there was no telegram from van der Velke and Constance. But how cold he felt, and how he was shivering! Brr, brr. It was as though his legs moved independently of his will, propelled by alien instincts, by energies outside himself. For his legs moved healthily, sturdily and quickly, with the click-clack of his sword knocking against his thigh, while, above those sturdy legs, his body shivered in the clutch of the monster, which licked and licked with fiery dabs of its tongue, and above his body towered his head, colossally large, with vertigos whirling like tangible circles around the huge head in which he seemed to be carrying a heavy lump of brains. From it there shot forth the strangest dreams, and these dreams, together with the contortions of the monster, filled the whole grey sky 
until everything became one great dream. All that town of unknown streets, houses, people who bowed and nodded to him, a couple of hussars who saluted, a couple of officers whom he knew and to whom he waved. Bonjour! Bonjour! And in the singular dreaming and waking and suffering and walking, he knew things which nobody had told him, knew them for certain, knew that a woman had drowned herself last night in Paris, in the lake in the Bois, knew that van der Velke and Constance had gone to fetch her body and were now bringing it back to him in a rushing express train, but a train that came rushing through the sky on whirling aerial rails, cutting through the contortions of a huge snake thing which wriggled round the clouds and filled the whole sky. Oh, how full the sky was! For round the snake wriggled like corkscrews the whirling rails, all aslant and askew, tangled into iron spirals, and the express, in which van der Velke and Constance sat with a coffin between them, containing a woman's blue corpse, had to follow all those turns and came rushing and puffing along them, constantly curving round its own track, and covering them a thousand times, as though the aerial express were climbing and descending, endless wriggling corkscrews. Then the rails and the dragon coils were all tangled together, and the rails became dragon coils, and the express flew and flew along the twisting dragon thing, flew along every curve of its tail. The train became a toy train, the dragon was enormous and filled the firmament. The town underneath was a toy town. And Gerrit walked and walked with hurrying legs, and his head towered colossally large, and his brains became like heavy clouds. He saw his lump of brains massing in curling clouds outside him. Nevertheless, he was propelled by instincts and energies of assured consciousness, for when he turned down the Kerkhoff Lahn and left the Kerkhoff, the cemetery behind him on one side, he knew quite well that there lay in it a blue woman who had been dragged out of the canal by policemen. But he also knew with equal certainty that up in the sky above the express flew and flew over the body of his dragon and along its every curve. And he also knew that he was now standing outside van der Velke's villa, so small a house, such a toy house, that Gerrit's head stuck out above the roof of it, and that his own voice sounded to him like a distant thunder as he asked the person who opened the door, Telegram? From your master and mistress? Telegram? He did not at once recognise who was at the door, nor at once understand the reply. Telegram! Telegram! he repeated, and the thunder of his voice sounded distant and dull, compared with the rattle of the express train right through the sky. "'What do you say?' he now repeated. "'What do you say?' "'Uncle, are you ill?' asked Addy. "'Ill? Ill? No, I'm not ill, my boy. But telegram, telegram. Papa and Mamma will be back tomorrow morning. They're bringing Henry's body with them, Uncle, and they're bringing Emily.' and I have been to the undertaker's to arrange to have the body fetched at the station at once. I've seen to everything, and I must go to all the uncles now, to Uncle Carol and Uncle Satsuma. I've telegraphed to Otto. I don't know if Aunt Bertha will come or not. It's very sad, Uncle, and it'll be very sad for Grandmamma when she knows everything. Henry, Henry was murdered. He was drunk, it seems, and... He drowned himself? and he was quite blue. No, uncle, he was murdered, stabbed with a dagger. Mamma is bearing up, Papa writes, but she is terribly overwrought, on Emily's account also. Emily is quite beside herself. Papa, fortunately, is keeping calm. He's doing all that has to be done. He's been to the legation. But, uncle, you're not at all well. You're shivering. You've caught a chill. Wanted you to go home and get into bed? Yes, yes, I'm going home. Then you'll be better in the morning. Yes, of course, of course. I shall be better. 
then will you come to the station too early to-morrow morning and meet the train from paris to-morrow morning early yes certainly certainly you oughtn't to have gone out no no but i'm going home now going to bed good-bye to-morrow morning early good-bye uncle gerrit went away above the woods on one side the low sky sank lower and lower heavy with grey clouds such heavy grey clouds that they did not seem light enough to continue hovering there seemed bound to fall and to gerrit they were in the dim hues of his fevered vision like purple pieces falling from the dragon's body which was cut up by the express the whole sky was full of purple dragon's blood and it now streamed down like pouring rain the blood streamed in a violent downpour and appeared intent upon drowning everything gerrit had now turned in the direction of the cemetery and impelled by instincts and forces outside himself he walked in and vaguely asked the porter some question he did not know what the man seemed to understand him however and led the way gerrit followed brr, brr. nevertheless it was as though his fever abated and in that sudden cooling he all at once felt and knew the truth it must be so it was she the water the policeman she who else could it be he walked on following the porter on either side the silent graves with their tombstones the lettering blurred and melancholy in the rain yonder on the left the family grave gerrit recognised it in the purple rain of dragon's blood a sombre mausoleum of brick like a small house and it looked larger to him than the toy villa of just now what a huge building it was that family tomb of theirs it was like a great palace it would be able to contain all their dead within its walls for the present papa was living alone there quietly but he was waiting waiting for all of them waiting for all of them until the shadows had deepened into thick darkness around all of them and they came to him in that huge sepulchral palace lord lord how small he was now he was walking like a dwarf past the tomb which stuck his steeple into the clouds high as a cathedral what was that strangeness in the air how long had he been walking was life no longer ordinary were there not as usual houses people things the barracks his children adeline who was that man who went before and led the way was it a real man that porter or was it a dead man walking wasn't everything dead here was it morning or was it evening was it life or death was he alive or was he dead Brr, how cold he felt again was that the cold of death what was this building which they now entered what a huge place was it a church or was it only a tomb where was he and why was he alone alone with that dead man that ghost showing him the way where on earth was constance and where was van der Velke? hadn't they brought it back from paris pauline's blue body was that pauline the coffin was open covered only with a sheet he lifted it the sheet brr, brr, how cold he was he remembered paris yes yes he remembered paris poor fellow poor henry but this wasn't henry who was it who could it be wasn't it henry the policeman found what had become of those policemen when was it he met some policeman it was years since he met those policemen and her body had turned quite blue what was the matter now what was that porter saying hovering round him like a ghost yes everything was dead for the shivering cold he felt could only be the cold shiver of death 
Blue? Was she blue? The man lifted a corner of the sheet. Gerrit saw a face, pale as that of a mermaid, whose features had blossomed up out of the icy stillness of a tragic pool. The eyes were open. What sad golden eyes those were! Had they not always laughed, with golden gleams of mockery? Then why did he now for the first time see them weeping, in death, see them mournfully staring, in death? Had they never laughed? Had they always gazed mournfully, even though they gleamed golden and mocked, or seemed to, seemed to? Then what was real? Was everything, was everything dead then? Did he, dead, want to bring her his gift? What she had asked for so strangely, the portrait, the portrait of his children. He had it here, he felt it lying on his chest, hard and heavy, like a plank. He had it here. Gerrit, dear, are you coming? Who was calling him from so very far away? Was it his sister, his favourite sister? Come along, Gerrit. Who were those calling him away from that woman? What were those voices which he vaguely recognised? Was it not the voice of his favourite sister? Was it not the voice of her husband, of the two of them, who had brought Pauline's body back from Paris? Yes, he recognised them. It was. Come on, Gerrit, old man, you're not well. What are you doing here beside this woman, beside this corpse? She's all blue. "'drowned in the lake in the Bois de Boulogne. "'Did you know the woman?' "'Yes, yes, he had known the woman. "'Come along, old chap. "'Gerrit, dear, won't you come?' "'Constance,' whispered Gerrit, "'you brought her from Paris.' "'Beg pardon, sir?' asked the porter. "'Yes, there she lies, there she lies, dead.' Gerrit, come away, Gerrit, come away, cried the voices. Lay your flowers over her now, Constance, lay your flowers over her. She is lying, so cold, and all alone, and it is all so big here, big as a church. She is lying, as if in a cold, damp church. Lay flowers beside her. What do you say, sir? Yes, lay flowers beside her, lay flowers beside her, Constance. Won't you come away now? Yes, yes, I'm coming. There she lay, covered all over with the sheet. She was nothing but a blue, motionless woman's shape under a sheet. Now flowers lay over the sheet, all the white flowers of his imagination, now his fingers tore into little pieces the plank which he carried on his heart and strewed them in between the flowers, into such little, little pieces that they were as the petals of flowers and nothing more over the woman. The voices called him, Yes, yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. The voices lured him home to bed and he jogged on through the streets raining with dragon's blood. When he reached home, Adeline at once sent for the doctor. It was typhoid fever. End of chapter 21「twenty two of the Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Next morning, in a mist, a drizzly mist, the relations met at the railway station. Otto van Nagel, Karel, van Satsuma, Uncle Reuvener, just back from India, Paul, Addy. They moved about in the waiting room on the platform with gloomy faces and upturned coat collars, waiting for the train which was late, which would not arrive for another quarter of an hour or twenty minutes. Does Grandmamma know about it yet? Uncle Reuvener asked Daddy. No, Uncle. No one liked to tell her. I believe the uncles and aunts would really prefer to keep it from her altogether. 
That's impossible. I think it would be very difficult, Uncle. Grandmamma might hear it from an outsider. She has friends who call to see her. Is Emily coming? Yes, Uncle. She'll stay with us. Is Uncle Gerrit very ill? Yes, Uncle. Very ill indeed. Does Grandmamma know he's ill? No. The children are now all out of the house, aren't they? We've got Alex and Guy with us. And we have Adelaide, Gerdi and Constant. The three little ones are at Otto's. Louise came and fetched them. Maritza is with Aunt Adolphine. Has Aunt Adeline anyone to help her? There are two male nurses, Uncle. Uncle Gerrit is very violent in his delirium. Oughtn't the train to be here soon? It's overdue now. It's a very sad affair. And how people will talk. Yes, how people will talk. Lord, Lord, how they're going to talk. Here comes the train, Uncle. The train steamed slowly into the station, like a grey ghost of a train, through the ghostly drizzling mist, and the waiting relations saw Constance, van der Velke and Emily get out, Emily leaning heavily upon Constance. Then came the dreary, dreary task of taking possession of the coffin. The hearse was waiting outside, and it all went as in a dream, in the ghostly, drizzling mist. How people will talk, Uncle Reuvener whispered to Carol and Van Satsuma, with whom he was sitting in the second coach. Yes, it's a damned rotten business. It's not over-respectable, having a nephew who becomes a clown, and then, it seems, goes and gets murdered in Paris. For a girl? Yes, some obscure story about a girl in Paris. I thought he had committed suicide. We really don't know anything. Constance wrote no particulars. In any case, it's not over-respectable. I call it a damned rotten business. Constance has gone on ahead with Emily. Yes, what a sight Emily looked. Very odd, that sister and brother. Yes, and it was because of him that she left her husband. And now, no doubt, through his own imprudence, stabbed, I suppose. Unless he committed suicide. Van Raven, after all, was a decent fellow. Van Raven, I believe you. Van Raven was a very decent fellow. Those young Van Nagels never had a sensible bringing up. No, I bring my boys up very differently. Ah, but then they're fine boys. Is van der Velke in the first coach? Yes, with Otto, Paul and Addy. Then why did they put us in the second coach? Perhaps it was a mistake. I dare say, but it's not the thing. Uncle ought to be in the first coach. Yes, and you too, Carol. Yes, and you too, Satsuma, of course. Well, I dare say it's a mistake. The thing wasn't arranged. No, but when van der Velke has to arrange a thing... It was that young bounder who arranged things. Addy? Of course. Oh, so that young bounder arranged things. Look here, what are we to say to Mamma? Well, I don't intend to mention it, for that matter. I know nothing. Nor I. The women had better do it. But they're much too upset. The best thing will be not to say anything. Yes, it's best not to say anything to Mamma. Lord, what a day! And I have to ride for an hour in this weather, at a foot's pace, behind the body of an undergraduate who has been sent down from Leiden and who must needs run away to Paris with his sister and become a circus clown, and go getting murdered into the bargain. But we mustn't tell anybody that. No, no, we won't speak about it. We'll merely say that he was taken ill. After all, it's a rotten incident for us. Yes, it's very rotten for us. Lord, Lord, how people will jabber. Of course they will. Of course they will. If things continue like this, I shall have to leave The Hague, said Carol. Cato said so too. He copied his wife's voice. He always copied her voice unconsciously when he talked about her. Are we nearly there? No such luck. Lord, what a day! How people will talk! The carriage containing Constance had driven on ahead of the procession. 
Emily leant against her feebly and listlessly, without speaking or hearing. When they approached the Kerkhoflan, Emily said, Auntie, it's just stupid chance. What, dear? Is this life? My life has never been anything but stupid chance. The little pleasure I had, and the sorrow, was all stupid chance. I am now so miserable, and it's all, all stupid chance. Oh, auntie, I shall never be able to live, not now, when Henry's death will always, will always haunt me like an accusing ghost. Auntie, do other people have so much stupid chance in their lives? If I hadn't gone to Paris, if Henry had not, oh, I can't say it, I can't say it. Auntie, we shall never know. It's too awful what's happened. I can never tell you what I think. My darling, I suspect it. Oh, it's awful, awful. Uncle suspects it too. So they do at the legation. It's awful, awful. He's disappeared. Edward, I mean. It was a mere accident. We were walking together, Henry and I, when we, when we met Edward. They looked at each other. They hated each other. Then he walked on. But we met him again later. Then, in the evening, when I came home and found Henry lying in his blood. She flung herself back with a scream. Auntie, auntie, we know nothing. But the suspicion will always be with me. I shall always see it like that. Oh, auntie, auntie, help me, and keep me with you always, always. She closed her eyes in Constance's arms, too weak to face her life, which had changed from fantastic humour into tragedy. The carriage suddenly stopped in the Kerkhoff Lan. Troucher opened the door. Constance made a sign to her to ask no questions. She herself, on the other hand, asked, how is Mr. Gerritz doing? Not at all well, ma'am. Where are the children? They're in the dining room, ma'am, playing. It's easier there for me to keep an eye on them. Constance opened the door of the dining room with her arm round Emily. She saw Gerdy and Constance, but, just as in the drawing room at home, they had hidden behind a sofa standing aslant where they were quietly playing at father and mother worshipping each other like a little husband and wife, two small birds in a little nest. peek boo said Constance mechanically. They were quiet at first, and then burst into chuckles, crept out, kissed Auntie and Emily. Auntie, asked Gerdy, is Papa ill? Yes, darling. Will Papa get better very soon? Oh, yes, dear. Are we staying with you long? No, not very long, darling. And Constance did not know why, but she suddenly saw the children staying on, and this vision was mingled with a vague impression of the gloomy house at Driebergen. She thought that her brain must be very tired in her head, that she was sleeping while awake, dreaming as she moved about. Everything before her was confused. That terrible day in Paris, Henry's body the mystery about the whole affair, with the dark, half-uttered suspicions, the formalities, the legation, the journey back. Oh, she was dead tired, dead tired. Oh, that coffin, that coffin. And in the middle of it all, a letter from Addie, Uncle Gerrit, seriously ill, the children ordered out of the house. He was taking Gerdy and Constant and giving them his room. He was sure Mamma would approve. Oh, how dead tired, how dead tired she was. Auntie, said Constance, Troucher has been so kind. She made us a lovely rice pudding. But we'd rather be at home, said Gerdy, and the children suddenly began to cry. Constance took them in her arms, pressed them to her. You would be just a little in Mamma's way she said with a dead voice. Mamma must look after Papa. And she dropped, almost fainting, into a chair. Aunt Constance, Emily sobbed, 
Aunt Constance, let me, let me stay with you. Let me stay with you. Where, where could I go? She sobbed wildly, huddled on the floor against Constance's knees. The children were also crying. Constance had put one arm round Emily and held the children in the other. It was very gloomy out of doors. Indoors, life's tragedy lay heavy upon them. End of chapter 22「Chapter Twenty Three of the Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The gigantic beast wriggled through the sky from end to end of the vast sky. The beast wobbled the point of its tail slowly up and down over the earth in the room above the bed which had become a narrow coffin, and commencing with that wobbling tail. The beast's body wound up and up, filling the room and the house with one mighty contortion of monstrous dragon scales, and sweeping away with its tangible reality all the dreamy unreality of the room and the house, the ceilings and the roofs. With thousands of legs, the beast humped its sinuous body over the chimney stacks and church steeples slung itself wriggling round the church steeples and chimney stacks like a festoon of scales which then turned into a long dense chain of clouds filling the sky with great cloud eddies which whirled and whirled over the town and through the sky from end to end of the vast sky and the monstrous beast now lifted its long crocodile's jaws out of its own winding clouds and its eyes belched forth fire like volcanoes, and shafts of flame shot like lightning flashes from its darting tongue, shafts darting to such a length from the very high expanse, right up there, up there from the sky above the clouds, that they shot through the man in one second, and retreated and hid themselves again in the abyss of the dragon's mouth from such a height indeed that they shot quicker than lightning right down to his marrow licking it until it dried up and after each burning lick after each dab of fire the lightning quick darting flame the miles long shaft withdrew to its own source and birthplace in the deep funnel of the fiery jaws and the martyred man shivered under the dabbing lick and in his shivering he raised himself high, as though upon waves of trembling, as though his fever were a stormy sea that bore him away from his bed, high above the clouds, the clouds that were the windings of the beast's body, and as he rose, as the man rose, the beast set up all its stiff bristles, which stuck out between its scales like trees, stuck them up and drew them in again, until the whole sky, the whole vast stretch of sky, was all the time growing full of tree trunks, straight forests of dragon's bristles, which swarmed and vanished, swarmed and vanished, as the beast put them out or drew them in. And the point of the beast's bristly scaly tail flicked with such oppressive weight upon the chest of the man who lay in the bed, which was a coffin, that the man moaned and groaned and tried with both hands to lift that heavy, flicking tail from his crushed heart. But the beast grinned with its cavernous jaws, shot fire from the volcanoes of its eyes, darted swiftly up and down the mile-long fiery trail of its all-penetrating tongue, split into myriad needles of fire, and with long voluptuous licks, sucked away the man's marrow, until the man, all shivering and shaking, was scorched and roasted and shrivelled within. The beast left him no blood, licked up his marrow and blood, and poured fire into him instead. When the beast smacked its lips voluptuously, when it greedily swallowed the blood and the marrow, when the man thought that he was dying, 
Then the beast pricked him with a needle of its fiery tongue, and goaded him to shivering point. And the man shivered, and raised himself high upon the waves with his shivering, as though his fever were a stormy sea. Thus the man lay, twisting and tossing, till he put out his hands towards the demon, and tried to fight the beast with human hands. And, it seemed to him, as if he were flinging his hands, the hands of a brave man and a martyr and a hero, around the beast. And while the stormy sea, the sky which was churned into billows by the contortions of the beast, bore him up and up and up, he fought and wrestled with the ever more violently writhing and coiling beast, and the beast humped its way through the sombre universe of clouds, shooting out its thousands of feet. Its head was now here, now there, its tail flicked, now high, now low. The beast lashed earth and sky. The beast became one vast, dizzying whirl, with towns, spires, roofs and chimney-stacks, all whirling in it. The bed which was a coffin was now here, now there, now high, now low, and he fought and wrestled and twisted round the beast, and the beast round him, and he would not let himself be conquered by the beast, until the beast from out of the volcano of its eyes and the abyss of its jaws belched so much fire that the sky was a sea of blood fire, wherein a hell of faces flamed, faces of women and children, naked women with eyes of gold, bright children with flaxen hair, like a sudden flowering of tortured affections, of tortured passions, all blossoming up in the blood fire, into faces of laughing and crying children, and ogling siren mermaids. And through it all, and through them all, the man writhed and wrestled with the wrestling, writhing beast, which could not free itself from him, even as he could not free himself from the beast. Gerrit, dear Gerrit, voices sounded, soft murmuring, earthly voices, voices from far below. Gerrit, dear, are you coming? And he answered, Yes, yes, I'm coming. And he, the man, heaving up and down, down and up, on the mighty swaying of the storm, down and up, up and down. He, this heaving, wrestling man, one with the beast, and the beast one with him, saw a woman between the faces of children and women, saw two women, two women belonging to him, his wife and his sister. But in between them crept a third woman, and her eyes mocked like golden eyes of mockery, until suddenly they ceased to mock, and died away in sadness, in unutterable sadness, as though really they had always been sad, and had never mocked or laughed. Gerrit, dear Gerrit, are you coming? Yes, yes, I'm coming. He's delirious, whispered Constance. The room around the sick man had now become as glass, but not transparent glass, for he no longer, through the walls of the room, saw the universe and the beast. He saw nothing now save the room, but so brittle was that room, so brittle all the things which it contained, that it seemed to be all of glass, the room, the bed, and he, all glass, all brittle glass, which a single incautious movement might shiver into dust. Yes, now that the beast had sucked up all his marrow with that voluptuous licking, it had let him go, left him lying exhausted on his bed. And he lay, his glass body lay powerless to move. And now that, after a long time, he had laboriously opened his eyes and saw his room around him as glass and felt himself as glass, he knew that the beast would no longer dart the fiery shafts of his tongue because it had eaten the whole of him up. His body lay lifeless, like a glass husk, and he asked himself if he wasn't dead. He did not know for certain that he was alive. 
he saw that the room was very quiet. Beside him, in the glass atmosphere of his room, sat a man who also seemed made of brittle glass, and the man sat motionless. He seemed to be sitting with a book in his hand, reading in the glassy twilight that filtered through the close-drawn window curtains. The sick man laboriously closed his eyes again, and it seemed to him that he sank away very slowly into a great downy abyss, lower and lower, a very depth of down into which he sank, and went on sinking, sank and went on sinking. "'There's less fever now,' said the military doctor. "'He's asleep. "'Is he out of danger?' asked the pale little wife, who sat with Constance's arms around her. "'Yes, you would be wise to take a rest, my frau. "'I can't, I can't. "'Go and get some sleep, Adeline,' said Constance. "'I'll stay in the room with Gerrit, and the nurse will keep a good watch.' "'He looked round for a moment, very peacefully, before he fell asleep,' said the male nurse by Gerrit's bedside. "'Go and get some sleep, Adeline.' How long the sick man sank and sank and sank into the downy abyss, no one knew. At last he opened his eyes again and looked into the room and saw the quiet attendant sitting on a chair at the foot of his bed where he also saw a woman standing. "'Constance!' the sick man murmured. He tried to smile because he knew her, but he felt too weak to smile. Another woman appeared beside the first. He knew her, too, but it was as though she were dead. Lean, murmured the sick man. He knows us, whispered Constance. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of The Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperos this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gerrit made progress every day. He was now so much better that he sat in a big chair, sat dozing until he sank away in the downy abyss and fell asleep in his chair. He was now so much better that he was able to speak a few words to the two women and the doctor and the nurse. And his first question was, The children! He had understood that they were not there, and that he would not see them just yet. He was now so much better that he remembered his recent life and asked, Wallin! And he saw that they did not understand. Why they did not understand he failed to see, for, when he asked after the children or Mamma, they always understood and answered kindly, telling him that Mamma and the children were well. Then he asked, Your husband, Constance? Your boy, and Constance answered that they were well. Then he asked, Pauline, and she gave a gentle, smiling nod. Yes, of course, she understood now, told him that Pauline was well. Yes, yes, he remembered. Mamma, the children, Pauline, they were as ghosts in his empty memory, looming up and making him ask questions of the women around him. But apart from that, his memory was one vast emptiness, like an empty universe, now that the beast had vanished into space, into nothingness, into nothingness. He had no marrow left. The beast would not eat him up any more. There was no centipede rooting at his carcass now. Lord, Lord, how done he felt, how utterly done for. He now recognised his doctor. Ah, is that you, Alsma? Well, Van Loer, do you recognise me? Yes, yes. Didn't I recognise you before? No, once or twice you didn't know who I was. Well, you'll soon be all right again now. You're getting better every day. Yes, yes, but... What? I feel very queer, damned queer. Yes. You're a bit weak still. A bit weak. He gave a grin. He felt his arm, thought it odd that he couldn't find his biceps. Where's the thing got to? He asked. Is it gone? 
No, you'll get your strength back all right. It doesn't take long once you're well again. Oh, it doesn't take long. No, you'd be surprised. I say, Alsma, God, I see my children. Just for once. No, it would tire you a bit. Later on, later on. I say, do you know what's so rotten? I don't know. All sorts of things, whether I've been dreaming or not. Don't worry about it. That'll all come right, bit by bit, bit by bit. A lake full of white-faced mermaids. That's rot, eh? An express train. Was I away shortly before my illness? I wasn't, was I? The body of a girl. Did I see that? A snake thing. A great wriggling snake thing. Yes, that snake thing was there all right. I'd fought the thing. I believe it was all rot, except the great snake thing, which licked me up with its tongue. You mustn't talk so much, because I always used to feel that snake thing inside me. Always. Come, Van Loer, keep very quiet now, and rest. Rest. The sick man sank away, sank away in the downy abyss. Gerrit made progress every day. He was now so much better that he had walked across the room on Constance's arm and just seen his two boys, only for a moment, because he longed for them so. The others too, he said. The next day they brought Maritza and Gerdi and Constant to him. The day after that, the four others. He had now seen them all. But for such a short time, he said. He recovered slowly. He had seen van der Velke and Addy, and, one pale, wintry, sunny day, he had been out for a little while, but the outside world made him giddy. Still, he couldn't deny it. He was getting better. He saw his mother, and when she saw him, she forgot that he had been ill. "'Where have you been, Gerrit?' "'Laid up, Mamma.' "'Laid up?' the old woman nodded wisely. You haven't been ill, have you? Just a little, Mamma. It wasn't very bad. And he got better. He made progress. He went out walking with his wife, with Constance, with van der Velke. He went out with his nephew, Addy. The outside world no longer made him giddy. On his walks, he recognised brother officers. One day he met the hussars. Oh, damn it all! he swore, without knowing why. It was as though he suddenly saw that he would never again ride, straight-backed, clear-eyed, at the head of his squadron. But it was all rot seeing that. Still, he was unable to resume his service. He lazed and loafed, as he said. In the evenings, always very early, he sank away into a downy abyss, dropped asleep heavily and he no longer remembered things. I say, Constance. What is it, Gerrit? When I saw that girl, in the cemetery, were you there too, and did you call me? No, Gerrit, you've been dreaming. Oh, did I dream that? Yes. No, no. Yes, Gerrit, you dreamt it. Another time he said to van der Velke, I say, van der Velke. What is it, Gerrit? You don't know, but I was carrying on with a girl, one I knew in the old days. Find out what's become of her, will you? What's her name, and where does she hang out? He reflected. Her name? Her name's Pauline. And where does she live? In, in the Frederikstraat. Van der Velke made enquiries, but said nothing next time he came. The sick man remembered, however. I say, van der Velke. Yes, Gerrit. Did you ask about that for me? Yes, van der Velke answered, hesitatingly. Well, the girl's dead, old chap. Did she drown herself? Yes. They took the body to the cemetery? Yes. Oh, then I wasn't dreaming. You see for yourself. And your wife came and fetched me there. No, no. Yes, she did. 
No, no, old chap. The sick man reflected. I no longer know, he said, what I've lived and what I've dreamed. The confounded snake thing. That, that was real. It had been eating me up, eating me up since I was a boy. He grew very gloomy and sat for hours and hours silently in his chair until he sank into the downy abyss. End of chapter 24「Chapter Twenty Five of the Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was time that he became the old Gerrit again, bit by bit, you know, bit by bit. The weeks dragged past, and the weeks became months, and it was time that he became the old Gerrit again, bit by bit, you know, bit by bit. His doctor wouldn't hear yet of his resuming his service, but he saw his pals daily. The officers looked him up, fetched him for a walk, and in their company he tried to go back to his breezy, jovial tone, his rather broad jokes, all the noisy geniality which had characterised the great yellow-haired giants that he had been. And it was all no use. He had grown thin, his cheeks were hollow. His flesh hung loosely on his bones, and he was soon tired, and, above all, soon giddy. But the rottenest part of it was that he didn't remember things. No doubt he felt that by degrees, with the diets prescribed for him, which Adeline observed so conscientiously, he would be able to strengthen his carcass a bit. He even took up his dumbbells once, in his grief at the disappearance of those grand muscles of his, but he very soon put the heavy weights down again. Then he smacked his emaciated thighs, and despite his inner conviction, yielded to a feeling of optimism. Oh well, he thought, that'll get right again in time. But the rottenest part of it was that he no longer remembered things. He was ashamed of that above all, he did not want it noticed, and that everybody noticed it. Then he would sit in a chair by the fire. It was a raw, damp January, cold without frost, and his thoughts stared out idly before him with a thousand roaming eyes, his idle thoughts. They hung heavily in his brain, filling it like clouds in a sky. He would sit like that for hours, with a newspaper or an illustrated weekly, French comic picture papers which van der Velke brought him to amuse him. He hardly laughed at the jokes, only half understood them, sat reading them stupidly, and, in his turgid brain full of clouds, full of those idle thoughts, an immense worldwide melancholy descended, a leaden twilight. The twilight descended from the sky outside, and it descended from his own brain. Then everything became chilly around him and within him, and, above all, memory was lost. Since the beast no longer held him in its clutching dragon's claws, since the thousand-legged crawling thing had devoured all his marrow with voluptuous licks, since it had perhaps sucked up his very blood, since then, it had left him like an empty house, with soft muscles and flabby flesh, and he almost longed to have the beastly thing back, because the beast had given him the energy to fight the beast, for himself in order to conquer, for others in order to hide himself. The beast had conquered, the beast had eaten him up, it wanted no more of him, the great dragon-worm had disappeared, it no longer wound through the skies, and nothing more hung in the skies but twilight's distilling clouds. Oh, the creepy, chilly twilight! Oh, the all-pervading mist, dank and clammy all round him! He shivered, and the fire no longer warmed him. He crept up to it, he could have crept into it, and the glowing open fire no longer warmed him. Lean, ring for some wood. I want to see flames, 
This coke's no use to me. Then he heaped up the logs until Adeline feared that he would set the chimney on fire. Or else Constance would come to fetch him, wanted him to go for a walk. No, dear, it's too chilly for me outside. He remained sitting in what to the others was the unendurable heat of the blazing fire. He shivered. He shivered to such an extent that he asked, Lena, send in the children. But, Gerrit, they'll only tire you. No, no, I'm longing to see them. They would come in, and when the others came home from school, he would gather them round him and try to play with them, teasing and tickling them now and again. It tired him, but they were something warm around him. More warmth radiated from a single one of them than from his glowing log fire. How many have I? he reflected, groping in his memory, which fled in front of him with winged irony. And he counted on his fingers. He was not quite certain until he saw them all gathered round him and had counted them on his fingers, silently. Marie, Adelaide, Alex, Guy. He did not always remember that he had nine. The children were very sweet. Marie saw to his oatmeal, which he had to take at five in the afternoon. The cheeky boys were very attractive. But he suffered because little Hurdy, the child with such a passion for caresses, had become afraid of him. She shrank back timidly from him, thinking him strange, that thin, emaciated father whom she used to embrace in her little childish arms as a strong father, a great big father who tossed her up in the air and caught her again and romped with her and kissed her. She had become frightened of his long lean fingers and looked in dismay at the hands that gripped her with the fingers of a skeleton. He noticed it and no longer asked her to come to his room now that he saw that she shuddered when she sat on his thin legs, and that she disliked the big fire which made her frown angrily and draw in her little lips. But it hurt him, though he said nothing. But what hurt him most was that he did not remember things. It was as though daily the twilight deepened around him, around his soul, which shuddered in his chilly, shuddering body. One day, Constance said, We have good news from Noonspate. But Gerrit remembered nothing about Noonspate. Still, he did not wish to show it. Really, he said. Nevertheless, she saw it in his blank look. Yes, she continued. Ernst is a great deal better. I shall go and see him again tomorrow. He now remembered all about Ernst and Noonspate but yet he was ashamed of his recent lack of memory, and his hollow cheeks almost flushed. A week later, Ernst came to see him with Constance. He was so much improved that the doctor himself had advised him to go to The Hague for a few days. He was staying with the van der Velkers. His hallucinations had almost vanished, and when Gerrit saw him, it struck Gerrit that Ernst was looking better, his complexion healthier, probably through the outdoor life, his hair and beard trimmed, and his eyes were not so restless, while he himself was neatly dressed under his sister's care. "'Well, old chap,' said Gerrit, "'so you've come to look me up. That's nice of you. I'm a bit off colour. And you? I'm much better, Gerrit. I'm glad of that. And those queer notions of yours. But about them?' Ernst gave an embarrassed laugh. Yes, he confessed shyly. I did have queer notions sometimes. I don't think I have any now, but I am staying on at the doctor's. I've only come up for a day or two. I've seen my rooms again. You have, have you? And your vases? Yes, my vases, said Ernst, greatly embarrassed. And all the voices that you used to hear, Ernst, all the souls that used to throng round you, old chap. You don't feel them thronging now. You don't hear them any longer. Gerrit tried to put on his genial bellow and to poke fun at Ernst about the vases and the souls as he used to, but it was no good. He lay back in his chair by the big fire 
and his idle thoughts stared before him. No, Ernst answered quietly, I only hear the voices now and again, and I no longer feel them thronging so much, Gerrit. And you've been very ill, haven't you? he added quietly. Yes, old chap. You're getting better, eh? Yes, I'm getting better now. My carcass can stand some knocking about. I'm glad you're better too. Constance made a sign to Ernst. He got up, good and obedient as a child, and they left Gerrit alone. Adeline was sitting in the other room with both doors open, because Gerrit's big fire was too much for her, and also because she didn't want the children to be running in and worrying him. Ernst is looking well, she said, glancing up at him. Then her hands felt for Constance's hands, and she began to cry, sobbing very quietly, lest Gerrit should hear. Hush, Adeline, hush. He won't get better. Yes, he will. He'll get quite well. Ernst is better too. But he, he's lost all his strength. He's so weak. He'll get well and strong again. What day of the week is it, Constance? It's Sunday, Adeline. I'm going with Ez to Mamma's for a minute or two. How glad Mamma will be to see him. Are you coming to Mamma's this evening, Sissy? Adeline shook her head. No, she said. I can't. I daren't leave Gerrit alone yet. End of chapter 25「Chapter Twenty Six of the Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oh, how the twilight was gathering! Oh, how it was gathering around him! It was dark now, quite dark, and the fire on the hearth was dying out in the dark, shadowy room. But what was the use of making it blaze up? Did the room not always remain shiveringly cold, however much the fire might glow? What was the use of lighting lamps? Was the twilight not deeper and gloomier, day by day, whether it were morning or evening? Did not the pale gold of the dawn shimmer more and more vaguely through the dense mist of twilight? A dull, apathetic, feeble man. Had he kept his secret all his life, concealed the real condition of his body and his soul, to become like that? And yet, was he not Ernst's brother? Had he not always been Ernst's brother, though it had always seemed otherwise? Were they not of the same blood, and had not they, the brothers, the same soul, the same darkened soul? Was the darkness not gathering around all of them now, the sombre twilight of their small lives? Would the darkness one day close in upon his own pale golden dawn, his children, who also shared the same soul? It might be the darkness of old age as it closed in upon Mamma. He could see her as she sat. Or it might be the darkness of sorrow and weariness and loneliness as yonder, round Bertha, were the shadows not deepening round Paul and Doreen for all their youth? Had it not been as a night round Ernst, even though he was now stepping out of the dark, back into the twilight that surrounded them all? Was it their fault, or the fault of their life, the small life of small souls? Did the twilight come from their blood, which grew poorer, or from their life which grew smaller? Would they never behold through the twilight the vistas, far-reaching as the dawn, where life, when all was said, must be spacious? And would they never strive for that? Would his children never strive for that? Would they never send forth the rays of their golden sunlight towards the greater life? And would they not grow into great souls? Would the twilight afterwards deepen and deepen and deepen around them too, 
until perhaps the very great things of life came thundering and lightening unexpectedly before them, crushing them and blinding them, because they had not learnt to see the light. He tried to remember thoughts of former days, but they shot ahead like winged ironies. He knew only that night was falling, one vast night, all around the family, under the grey skies of their winter. He knew only that the light was growing dimmer and dimmer around them, until it became unillumined dusk, the dusk of age, the dusk of sorrow, the dusk of cynical selfishness, the dusk of life without living. All the heavy, sombre twilights that's gathered around small souls, until with Ernst the dusk had grown into night and the dark dream from which he was now emerging. They called that recovering. They thought he would recover. Oh, how dark and gloomy were the shadows of the twilight, and how heavy was the fate that hung over their small souls hung over them like a leaden sky, an immensity of leaden skies. He, yes, he would get better. It might take months yet, and then he would resume his service as a dull, decrepit old man, diseased through and through, from his childhood, under the semblance of muscular strength, until one serious illness was enough to break him and to make him dull and old for the rest of his life. Yes, he would get better, but it would no longer be necessary to raise his voice to a roar, to make his movements rough and blunt, to make a show of strength and force and roughness, for they would now all see through the sad pretense. He would jog along through his small shadowed life until the shadows gathered around him as they were now gathering around his mother. And, and, and his children would never again recognise in him their father of the old days, who used to romp with them and fill the whole house with all the rush of his healthy vitality. It was over, over for the rest of his life. It was over. In the room which had grown chill and dark, the black thought haunted him that it was over. It almost made him calm to know that it was over, that for his children, his nine, did he not remember their golden number correctly, he could never be other than the shadow of their father of the old days. Oh, would he never again be able to love them, to be a father to them? Could he never do that again? Must he, when cured, remain for all the rest of his life the man conquered by the beast, the man eaten up by the beast, the man broken in the contest with the dragon beast. Was it so? Was it so? Why did they leave him in the cold and the dark? Shivers ran down his back, his marrowless back, his bloodless body, like a stream of ice-cold water. Why didn't they make up his fire, and why didn't they light his lamp? Did they know that nothing could give him warmth and light? Adeline! His voice sounded faint and weak. In the next room, which was now dark, nothing stirred. He rose out of his deep chair with difficulty, like an old man. He groped round for the door of the other room, a feeble light still entered from outside. There she sat, there she lay, his wife. She had fallen asleep with weariness and anxiety for him, her arms on the table, her face on her arms. Was it her imagination, or had she really changed? He had not noticed her for weeks, since his illness had not looked at her, though she had nursed him all the time. Certainly he was very fond of her, but she was doing her duty as his wife. She had borne him his children, and she was nursing him now that he was ill. Had he been wrong in thinking like that? Yes, perhaps it had not been right of him. God, how she had changed! 
How different from the young, fresh face that she used to have. The little mother girl, the little child mother. Was it the ghostly effect of the faint light, or was it so? Was she so pale and thin and tired, with anxiety about him, with nursing and looking after him? He felt his heart swelling. He had never loved her as he did now. He bent down and kissed her, with a fonder kiss than he had ever given her. She just quivered in her sleep. She was sound asleep. Lord, how tired she was! How pale she was! How thin! She lay broken with worry and weariness, her head in her arms. Adeline! She did not answer. She slept. He would not wake her. He would ring for the fire and the lamp himself. But what was the good? Lamp and fire would make things no brighter around him, now that the great twilight was descending. Oh, the great, inexorable, pitiless twilight! Would it fall around him, as it had fallen around Ernst, around whom it was now slowly clearing? Did the twilight clear again? Or would the shadows around him gradually deepen into darkness, the darkness that was now gathering around his mother? Or would it just remain dim around him, with the same one light that glimmered around Paul and Doreen? What, what would their twilight be? The house was very cold and he felt chilly. Was there no fire anywhere? Where were the children? Were Maricha and Adelicha and the two boys not back from school yet? He now heard Herdy and Constance playing in the room downstairs, the nursery and dining room, heard them talking together with their dear little voices. Oh, his two sunny-haired darlings! But Herdy was afraid of him. He was becoming afraid of himself. He was no longer the man he used to be. People now saw him as he was. He could no longer put on that air of brute strength. His voice had lost its blustering force. He did not know why, but he roamed through the house. It struck him as lonely, dreary and quiet, though the children were playing below. He stood on the stairs and listened. What was that rushing noise in the distance? No, there was no rushing. Yes, there was. Something came rushing, from outside, to where he stood. Something came rushing, a melancholy wind, like a wind out of eternity, an immense eternity, and immense the wind that rushed out of it, and chilly and small and dreary the house. Everything so small, he himself so small. He did not know what was coming over him, but he felt frightened, frightened, as he had sometimes felt when a child. He was so afraid of that rushing sound that he called out, Adeline, lean! He waited for her to hear and answer, but she did not hear, she slept. Then he roamed on, shuddering, upstairs to his own little room, and it was all so dreary and chill and lonely and the sound of rushing from the immense eternity outside the house was so melancholy that he sank helplessly into a chair and began to sob. He was done for now. He sobbed. His great emaciated body jolted up and down with his sobs, his lungs panted with his sobs, and in his great lean hands his head sobbed in despair. He was done for now. He knew now that he would not get well. He knew now that he ought really to have died, and that he had gone on living, only because his life had gone on hanging to a thread that had not been broken. Would that last thread soon break, or would his darkened life go on for a long time? He, always ill, hanging to that last thread. Would he yet be able to be a father to his children, or would he, on the contrary, become a burden to his dear ones? Was it growing dark? Was it growing dark? 
was not that eternity rushing along. He heaved a deep sigh amid his sobs. His eyes sought along the wall where a rack of swords and Malay krises hung between prints of racehorses and pretty women. He had a whole collection of these weapons. Some of them had belonged to his father. At Papa's death they had been divided between him and Ernst. Among the krises and swords were two revolvers. He stared past the swords and krises, and his eyes fastened on the revolvers. In among the swords and krises, in among the racehorses and the pretty women, whirled all the heads of his children. He did not know if they were portraits or spectres, as they had been, children's heads of six months, one year old, two years old, growing older and bigger, radiating more and more sunlight, his golden dawn of nine bright-haired children. Would he be able to be a father to them, or would he, on the contrary, become a burden? It was as if his imagination were digging in a deep pit, in a deep pit his imagination, with hurrying hands, dug up sand. What was it seeking, his rooting imagination? What was it seeking in the deep pit? Why was it flinging the sand around him, just as Addy once told him that Ernst had dug and flung up sand? in the dunes, in the dunes at Noonspait. What, what, was he going mad too? Was he going mad like Ernst? Was he going mad like Ernst? A cold sweat broke out over his chilly, shivering body. Was he going mad? Gerrit, Gerrit, a voice sounded very far away through the house which has suddenly become very deep, very wide, very big. Gerrit, Gerrit! He could hear the hurrying footsteps on the creaking stairs, but he was powerless to answer. Gerrit, Gerrit, where are you? The door opened. It was Adeline looking for him in the dark. Gerrit, are you here? Even yet he did not answer. Where are you, Gerrit? Here. Are you here? Yes. Why are you sitting in the dark, in the cold? What are you doing here, Gerrit? I... I was looking for something. For what? I've forgotten. Why didn't you ask me? She had lit the gas. You were asleep. Don't be angry, Gerrit. I was tired. I'm not angry, dear. I didn't like to disturb you. Why didn't you wake me? You were asleep. You ought to have waked me. He put out his arms to her. Come here, dear. She came. He drew her to his knees. What is it, Gerrit? Darling, Lena, I believe I'm very, very ill. You've been ill, Gerrit. You're, you're getting better now. Do you think so? Oh, yes. Lena, I believe I'm very... Very ill. Why, do you feel worse? It's so cold in here. Come downstairs. We'll make up the fire. No, stay here. Tell me, Lena, if I died, would you? No, no, Gerrit, I can't bear it. Hush, dear. If I died, would you believe, after I'm dead? Oh, Gerrit, Gerrit. That I have always been very fond of you. Gerrit, don't. That I have always been kind to you. That I have not neglected you. Oh, you're not going to die, Gerrit. You will get better. And you have always, always been kind. Lena and all our children. Don't, Gerrit. Won't they think, if I die, that I had no business to die, because I ought to have lived and been a father to them? But, Gerrit... You're not going to die. I should like to go on living, Lena, for you, dear, and for the children. But I fear I'm very ill. Will you see the doctor, Gerrit? No, no. Stay like this, quietly, for a minute, on your husband's knees. Lena, Gerdy has become frightened of me. Tell me, Lena, are you also frightened of your skeleton of a husband? 
Gerrit, Gerrit, no, Gerdy isn't frightened, and I, I'm not frightened. Put your arms round me. She put her arms right round him. She hugged him, warmed him against herself, while she sat upon his knees. I'm not frightened, Gerrit. Why should I be frightened of you? Because you've been ill, because you've grown thin. Aren't you still my husband, whom I love, whom I have always loved? Shan't I nurse you till you are yourself again, till you are quite well and strong? Oh, Gerrit, even if it should take weeks, months, a year. Gerrit, what is a year? In a year's time you will be yourself again, and well, and strong, and then we shall be happy once more, and then our children will grow up. Yes, dear, if only it doesn't get dark. Gerrit. If only it doesn't get so dark. Do you know that it's got very dark around Ernst? It's getting lighter around him now, but there's some twilight around him still, even now. Do you know that it's getting dark around Mamma, and that it will get darker and darker? Do you know that the twilight is closing around Bertha, and that there's twilight around the others? Lena, darling, I'm frightened, I'm frightened, when it gets dark. As a child, I remember, I used to be frightened when it grew dark. You've lit the gas now, you see, Lena. Is there only one light burning, the flame of a gas jet, and yet, and yet it's getting dark. Gerrit, my Gerrit, is the fever returning? Would you like to go to bed? Yes, Lena, I want to go to bed. Put your baby to bed, Lena. It's tired. It's not well. Put it to bed, Lena, and tuck the nice warm clothes round its cold back, and promise to stay and sit with it till it's asleep, till it's asleep. Put it to bed, Lena. And Lena... If your baby, if your baby dies, if it dies, will you promise never to think that it did not love you as much as it ought to? She had gently forced him to rise from his chair, and she opened the partition door. He stood in the middle of the little room, while she busied herself in the bedroom and lit the gas, and then came back for him and helped him undress. It's getting dark, it's getting dark, he muttered, shivering while his teeth chattered with the cold. And he felt that it was not the cold of fever, but a cold in his veins and his spine, because the beast had sucked all his blood and marrow with its voluptuous licks, had eaten him up from the days of his childhood, had devoured him until now in the twilight. His soul shrank and withered in his body, which had no more sap to feed it. It's getting dark, he muttered. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of The Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperus This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was snowing heavily. For days the great snowflakes had been falling over the small town, out of an infinite skyland, out of infinite sky plains of infinite snow, and after all the gloom of the dark days that had been, the days under grey skies of storm and rain, it was now snowing whiter and whiter, out of a denser greyness of sky plains and skylands. Flakes falling upon flakes in a soft white shroud of oblivion that enveloped houses and people. And in that ever-falling snow from the great grey infinity above the small town and the small people, the town seemed still smaller, with the outline of its houses now scarcely defined against the all-effacing oblivion which fell and fell without ceasing and the people also seemed still smaller, as they moved about the town, or looked through the windows of their small houses at the white flakes descending from the grey infinity overhead. For old Mrs. Van Doer, 
The white days dragged on monotonously from Sunday to Sunday. Only the Sunday gave her a glimpse of light. But the other days had become so white and blank, so white and blank in their twilight emptiness. Even though the children called to see her regularly, she no longer knew that they had been. It was only on Sundays that she missed them, when she did not see all of those whom she still carried in her mind gathered in her large rooms, rooms which not to the largest fires now seemed able to warm, a mournful reproach swelled up in her heart, and her head nodded in sad understanding and protest against the sorrows of old age. "'But here is Ernst, Mamma, coming again as he used to,' said Constance, leading Ernst by the hand to her mother. He came up once a week from Noonspates for the day in order to reaccustom himself to all the familiar things at The Hague, to the houses and the people, and, though still a little shy as usual, he had lost all his nervous restlessness and become quite calm. Ernst? asked Mamma. Yes, Mamma, he is coming again as he used to. Has he been long away? Yes, Mamma. Light seemed to break upon the old woman, and she smiled, becoming younger in her smile, now that she remembered. She took her son's hands and looked at Constance with unclouded eyes. Is he better now? Yes, Mamma, said Constance. Are you better now, Ernst? Yes, Mamma, I am much better. She looked very glad, as though a flood of light were shining around her. Don't you hear any of those, those strange things? No, Mamma, he answered, smiling gently. And don't you see, don't you see any of those strange things? No, Mamma, that's good. She said it with grateful, shining eyes, the flood of light making everything very clear. I have been very strange, I believe, Ernst admitted. "'softly and shyly. "'That's all cured now, Ernst,' said Constance. "'But Aunt Lot,' asked Mamma, "'what's become of her and the girls?' "'They've gone to Java, Mamma. "'To Java? "'Yes, don't you remember? "'They came and said good-bye last week. "'They'll be back in twelve months. "'Don't you remember? "'They thought they could live more cheaply in India.' Yes, yes, I remember, I remember, said the old woman. India, I wish I could go there myself. She felt as if she must go there to have warmth in and around her. And yet, Ernst was back, and at the card tables were Carol and Cato, Adolphine and her little tribe. Otto and Francis were there, van der Velke, Doreen and Paul, Addy. There are a good many, after all, she said to Constance. There are a great many, but I miss, I miss. Who, Mamma? I miss my big lad. I miss Hedit. Where is Hedit? He hasn't been very well lately, Mamma. I don't think he'll come. He is ill again. Not ill, but... Yes, he is. He's ill. He's very seriously ill. Constance, what is it, Mamma? You're the only one to whom I dare say it. Constance, Gerrit is very, very ill. Hush, he's, he's dead. No, Mamma, he's not dead. He is dead. No, Mamma. Yes, child. Look, don't you see in the other room? What, Mamma? That he's dead. No. What do you see in the other room, then? Nothing, Mamma. I see the two card tables, and Carol, and Adolphine, and Adolphine's two girls, playing cards. And that's light. What's light? All oh, that's light. Don't you see it? No, Mamma. He's lying there, on the floor. No, no, Mamma. Be quiet, child. I can see it plainly. There. Now it's gone. Mamma, darling. Constance. Yes, Mamma. Go. Go to Hedit's house. Do you want me to go to him? No, no. Stay here. 
Constance. Yes, Mamma. Send your husband or your son. Are you feeling anxious? Anxious? No. But send your husband or your son. Send Addy. If you send Addy, that'll be best. Would you like him just to go and find out for you how Helis is? Yes, yes. What's the matter with Mamma? asked van der Velke. Isn't Mamma well? asked Adolphine at the card table. Mamma is very restless and excited, said van Satsuma. Hadn't we better send for the doctor? The doctor, the doctor, the doctor, they repeated irresolutely. Adi, asked Doreen, are you going to the doctor's? No, I'm going to Uncle Gerrit's. Granny is uneasy. She wants to know how he is. Constance, whispered the old woman with strangely luminous eyes, it's better that you should go too. Addy's gone now, Mamma. You go too, with your husband. You and your husband go too. Tell the others that I'm tired. Let's them go away. Now, soon. Tell the others that I'm tired, dear. And tell them, tell them, tell them what, Mamma? That I am too tired to. Yes, on Sundays. To have us here on Sundays, Mamma? No, dear, no. Don't say it, don't say that, but tell them that this evening, this evening, is the last time, the last evening. No, dear, no, not the last. Just tell them to go away, dear, and you go with your husband. Has Addy gone? But you go now, you go also, to Gerrit's house, and then come back here again. I want to see you, all three of you, here again. Do you understand? All three of you, do you understand? Yes, Mamma. Go now, go. They went, and the children took their leave. Outside it was snowing great flakes. The snowflakes had been falling all through the night over the small town, out of an infinite land of death, out of infinite sky plains of infinite death. And, after all the gloom of the dark nights that had been, the nights under the grey skies of storm and rain, it had snowed whiter and whiter out of the dense greyness of sky plains and skyland, flakes falling upon flakes in a soft white shroud of oblivion that enveloped houses and people. End of chapter 27「Chapter Twenty Eight of the Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Outside the snow was falling in great flakes. The parlourmaid had opened the door. But your cab isn't here yet, ma'am. It doesn't matter. We'll walk. I must say, it's a little absurd of mamma, said van der Velke on the doorstep. Must we go to Gerrit's? In this weather, and has Addy gone too? Was Mamma as anxious as all that? It's snowing hard, Constance. It's enough to give one one's death to go out in this weather. Well then, you stay, Henry. Do you mean to go in any case? Yes, Mamma wants me to. But it's absurd. Perhaps so, but she would like it, and we mayn't be able to do things to please her much longer. Then send the cab on to the banker's straat when it comes. Very well, sir. They went. Didn't Addy go just now? Yes, a minute or two before we did. I don't see him. He walks very fast. Was Mamma so uneasy? Yes, she was very restless and anxious. Have the others gone away as well? Yes, Mamma was tired. All the same, she relies upon us to come back presently for a moment. Mamma is becoming a little exacting. She's growing so old. We may as well give her that pleasure of just going. How much gentler her tone had become. Once, ah, once she would have flared out at him violently for less than this little difference. Now, ah, now, how much gentler everything about her had become. She stumbled through the snow. Take care, Constance. The pavements are slippery 
Take my arm. No, I can manage. Take my arm. She took his arm. She slipped again. He held her up. He felt that she was trembling. Are you cold? No, you've got a thick cloak on. I'm not cold. What are you so nervous about? I don't know. Your nerves have been all wrong for some time. You often cry about nothing. Yes, I don't know why. It's nothing. It's the weather. Yes, our Dutch climate. Now at last it's something like winter. It's freezing like anything. The snow is crisp underfoot. She slipped again. He held her up and they walked close together in the driving snow which blinded them. I must say, it's absurd of Mamma to send us out in this weather. She did not answer. She understood that he thought it absurd. The cold took her breath away, and it seemed to her, as she kept on slipping, that they would never reach the Bankerstraat. At last, they turned the corner of the Nassau Plain, and she calculated not quite ten minutes more, then a moment with Gerrit and Adeline. The cab would fetch them there, then back to Mamma's with Addy to set Mamma's mind at ease. And, as she reckoned it out, she grew calmer and thought, with Henri, that it was certainly rather absurd of Mamma. She planted her feet more firmly. She was now walking more briskly, still holding her husband's arm. Was it the cold or what that made her keep on trembling with an icy shiver? Now, at last, they were nearing the Bankerstraat and Gerrit's house, and it seemed to her as if she had been walking the whole evening through the thick, crisp snow. Suddenly she stopped. Henry, she stammered. What? I, I daren't. What daren't you? I daren't ring. Why not? I daren't go in. But what's the matter with you? Nothing. I'm frightened. I daren't. But, Constance. Henry, I'm trembling all over. Are you feeling ill? No, I'm frightened. Come, Constance, what are you frightened of? Now that we're there, we may as well ring. What else would you do? Here's the house. He rang the bell. They waited. No one came to the door, and the snow beat in their faces. But there's a light, he said. They haven't gone to bed. And Addy? Yes, Addy must be there. Ring again, she said. He rang the bell. They waited. The house remained silent in the driving snow. There was a light in nearly every window. Oh, Henry! He rang the bell. Oh, Henry! She began to sob. I'm frightened. I'm frightened. She felt as if she were sinking into the snow in a fleecy, bottomless abyss. Her knees knocked together, and he saw that she was giving way. He held her up, and she fell against him, almost swooning. He rang the bell. The door was opened. It was Addy who opened the door. They entered. Constance staggered as she went, and in her half-swooning giddiness she seemed to see the house full of whirling snowflakes coming through the roof, filling the passage and the rooms. And, amid this strange snow, her son's face appeared to her as the face of a ghost, very white with the blue flame of his big eyes. At that moment there came from upstairs a wailing cry, a long-drawn-out shriek, uttered in an agony of despair, and that cry seemed to call to Constance out of Adeline's body, through all that night of snow, indoors and out. Mamma, papa, hush! Uncle Gerrit! Uncle Gerrit is dead! Uncle Gerrit has... It was snowing before Constance's giddy eyes as she went up the stairs with her husband and her son. It was snowing wildly, a whirl of all obliterating white. It was snowing all around her, and through it, for the second time, Adeline's long wail of despair rang out loud and shrill. The rooms upstairs were open. The maids and Maricha, in her little nightgown, were peeping round the doors, trembling. Gerrit's little room was open, and on the floor lay the big body, looking bigger still, stretched out like that. And, beside it, beside the big body, on her knees, the wife, 
the small fair-haired wife, and her wail of despair rang out for the third time. Adeline! She now looked round, flung up her arms, felt her sister's arms, Constance's arms, around her. He's dead! He's dead! No, Adeline, perhaps he's fainted. He's dead! He's dead! He's cold! Wet! Blood! Feel! She uttered a scream of horror, the small fair-haired wife, and suddenly drawing herself up, she looked at the sword-rack. Yes, the missing revolver was clutched in his stiff hand. Van der Velke and Addy closed the doors. The maids were sobbing outside, but the sound of little voices came and small fists banged at the closed door. Mama! 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 Aunt Constance! Constance rose, giddy and fainting, not knowing whether to go or stay. Constance! Constance! cried Adeline, calling her back, holding her in her arms. Mama! Mama! Aunt Constance! Aunt Constance! Constance rose to her feet, made a vast effort to overcome that dizzy faintness, and now that the body of the small fair-haired woman lay moaning upon the body of the dead man, she opened the door. Was every light in the house full on? Why were the maids sobbing like that? Was it real, then? Was it real? Was this Maricha, clasping her so convulsively, trembling in her little nightgown? Were these Guy and Alex, sleepy still their gentle eyes, cheeky their little mouths? Were these Herdy, oh so frightened, and little Constant? Aunt Constance! Aunt Constance! She overcame her dizziness. She did not faint. Darlings! My darlings! Hush! Hush! And she led them back to their bedroom. What could she do but embrace them? but press them to her. Darlings! My darlings! The wail of despair rang out once more. Oh, she must go back to that poor woman. Oh, she had not arms enough, not lives enough. Oh, she must multiply her life tenfold. Mamma, it was Addy speaking. The cab is here. I'm going for Dr. Alsmer. One of the maids has gone to another doctor, close by. Yes, dear, and then, and then go to, oh, go to Grandmama's. She's expecting us. I know for certain that she's expecting us. Stay in here, darlings. Don't leave the room. Promise me. And Addy, don't tell her. Don't tell her anything yet. Tell her, tell her that. The wail of despair rang out, and there were only two of them now that Addy was gone. There were only two of them. Helpless, she and Henry, in that night of death and snow, as though death was snowing outside, as though death was snowing into the brightly lit house, with its all obliterating whiteness, dazzlingly light, dazzlingly white. There were only two of them. End of chapter 28「Chapter Twenty Nine of the Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The twilight had passed away in the dazzling white lights, but yonder, in the big, dark, chilly house, the old woman sat waiting. She had sent the maids to bed and told them to put out all the lights, but she herself did not go to bed. she waited. She sat in her big dark room, with just a candle flickering on the table beside her. It seemed to her that she was waiting a long time. She felt very cold, though she had put her little black shawl round her shoulders, and she peered into the frowning shadow which quivered with dancing black ghosts and with the flickering of the candle. It was a dance of ghosts hovering silently round the room, and they seemed to have come from the distant past to haunt her, to have come out of the things of long ago, of very long ago, far off, forgotten years of childhood and girlhood. The young man whom she had married, their long life together, 
their children young around them. Then the rise of their greatness, the rise of the white palaces in tropical climes, the glitter around them and their children of all the glittering vanity of the world. Then the children growing up and moving farther and farther away from her, and she saw it all looming so darkly and so menacingly in the long dark rooms, while she sat waiting and watching by the flickering flame of the candle. Then her old head nodded very slowly up and down, as if to say that she recognised all the things of long ago which loomed so darkly and threateningly, that there was not a ghost which she did not recognise but that she did not understand why they all thronged round her to-night, like a vision of menace, a dance of death. And while she sat and wondered, it was as if each dancing phantom blacked out something of the room and the present that she still saw faintly gleaming, blacked out, one outline after the other, with dancing phantom after dancing phantom, until, at last, all was black around her, and not only the room and the present had become black, but also the pale visions of the past, the years of childhood and girlhood, the young man whom she had married, and the children, and all the life yonder in the white palaces amid the tropical scenery. Black, everything became black, until everything was blotted out, until the dance of all those phantoms was obliterated in shadow, and the old woman, nodding her head, still sat peering into the dark, with the flickering candle beside her. Thus she sat and waited, and with the darkness before her, it was as if she did not see the candle now that everything had become black. Thus she sat and waited and wondered, whether many and many nights would still drag their blackness over her. How many black hours, how many black nights could the black future still drag along? Until at last she heard a bell clanging like a shrill alarm through the livid darkness, and mechanically, because she was waiting, she rose painfully and took her candle. Through the dark room and the dim passage she went, and the faint light went with her, so faint that she did not see it, that she just groped her way painfully through the passage and down the stairs, still holding high the candle. The stairs seemed steep to her, and she went cautiously, waiting on each step. At each step the faint light of the candle descended with her, and behind her, the night accumulated with each step that she left behind her. She had now reached the foot of the stairs, and slowly and painfully, with the dragging tread of age, she went through the hall to the front door whence the alarm had rung, and her trembling hand opened the door. Addy entered. Granny, is that you yourself? Yes, child. I came, Granny dear, because Mamma said that you expected us. Yes. Were you waiting up for us, Granny? Yes. He took the candle out of her hand. I've come to say, Granny, that there's nothing wrong with Uncle Gerrit. She nodded her head wisely. Now you won't wait any longer for Mamma, Granny, and you'll go to bed, won't you? Can I do anything more for you? She nodded her head. Yes, she said. What, Granny dear, shall I hold the candle for you, and will you go to bed then? No, no. What do you want to do then, Granny dear? Wait. Are you still waiting for Mamma? Yes. But perhaps she won't come. She nodded her head again. He gently led her away from where she stood and up the stairs. So you are not going to bed yet? She shook her head. Are you still expecting Mamma? She nodded. Shall I light the gas, Grandmamma? She put her hand on his arm to prevent him. No, no she said. It's dark. There is no light. But won't you have the gas lit, Grandmamma? There is no light. You would do better to go to bed. Mamma's coming. She will hardly come now, Granny. She's coming. A bell rang, and Addy started. She's coming, repeated the old woman. Addy went downstairs and opened the door. 
It was Constance, with a cab, in the driving snow. Mamma, I've come. I left the doctor and papa with Aunt Adeline. Grandmamma is expecting you. They went in, and it seemed to Constance as though, after the whiteness outside and all the despair yonder, she saw it snowing here, inside the house, snowing black, with dark black snowflakes, inside the hall, inside the rooms, and the face of her mother, sitting beside the candle, stared at her like a ghost with glassy eyes. Mamma, Constance, there's nothing wrong with Gerrit. No, oh no, Mamma, I'm glad, I'm glad, dear, and there's nothing wrong with Ernst either. No, oh no, Mamma, so there's nothing wrong with any of them. No, they're all well, Mamma, all well. All well, I'm glad, dear, especially as tonight. What, Mamma? It's the last time, the last Sunday. I am too tired, dear, and they, they are all too far. And if there's nothing wrong with any of them, if they're all well, then, then, no more Sundays. And this house is too big. And the house is so cold, so cold. The house is so cold and so big. And the cold house is so dark. And Mamma wants... What do you want, Mamma? To come to you, dear, now that you are back from Brussels. To you, dear. Mamma. Mamma wants to come. To you. Do you want to come to us, Mamma? Yes. To you, dear here to you dear so credit is well oh yes mamma he's well then then all is well suddenly the candle flared up and went out then they lit the gas and took the old woman up to bed she submitted like a child for around her after her last glimmer of light the twilight had deepened into black night End of chapter 29 End of The Twilight of the Souls by Louis Couperus Read by Phil Benson The story of the small souls continues in the final volume of the quartet, Dr. Adrian.